Let us pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather and worship for you and for giving us your written word. Grant us wisdom, we humbly pray, to discern your will and obedience to follow it, and teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. My wife and I recently went to a wedding this past weekend for a childhood friend of mine, and it was someone who I've known for probably 20 years at least. And there's something about a proper wedding, a traditional wedding, one that honors God, where you're invited by a loved one to share with them in this mountaintop experience. And with that, it stirs up a sense of nostalgia. You're with them up on this mountaintop, and from this vantage point, you're able to look down upon all of the memories which you've shared with one another. And for some of those memories, you remember them as if it happened yesterday. Whenever we gather for major life events, we can't help but point out to each other just how fast time goes by. Why aren't we more aware of this idea, this fleeting nature of life? The vast majority of our lives are spent in ignorance and denial of our own mortality. But scripture constantly reminds us to do the opposite. The refrain from Psalm 90 verse 12 has incredibly wide-reaching implications. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Psalm 90 here today sets the tone for how we should read all of the other readings given to us in today's lectionary. And verse 12 is the lens through which we should be reading them, as well as our entire lives. It is that admitting our time here on earth is short, it is uncomfortable, but it's not morbid. We think it is, but in fact it's required in order to live a proper Christian life. Let's look at a few verses back in Psalm 90. This is a psalm which inspired Isaac Watts' powerful hymn, O God, Our Help in Ages Past, which we just sang. And if you pay close attention to the lyrics in that hymn, you will see that for parts it almost follows Psalm 90 verse for verse, which is, I would say, an example of how lyrically beautiful the Psalms are in their own right. Turning to the scripture reading, the psalmist begins his song by reflecting on God's protection across the generations. Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. And he makes clear that the Lord's provision goes hand in hand with his eternal nature. Before the mountains were brought forth, or the land and the earth were born, from age to age you are God. And by contrast, the span of earthly creatures is nothing more than that of a speck of dust. You turn us back to the dust and say, Go back, O child of earth. Yet verse 4 is the one which so fascinates the contemporary Christian mind. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past and like a watch in the night. Many have looked to this verse for something like a decoder ring or a mathematic conversion to figure out things like the precise age of the earth or the exact date of the second coming of Christ. But to do so is to miss the point here. Verse 4 is a beautiful lyrical description of the point already made that God is eternal. And 
we are not. God exists outside of time and space. That's why eternity is so hard for us to comprehend because it's so totally other and outside of our experience. And that's likely why we try so hard not to think about it. The concept of eternity for sure is one that would easily overwhelm us if we became preoccupied with it. But verse 4 is also incredibly fascinating because it reminds us of God's ultimate and perfect perspective. For we exist in the sphere of creation where all time and space exists and God in heaven exists outside of that space. He's existing outside of creation and looking, looking down upon it. And this is why verse 4, as a literal numerical conversion, makes no sense. God does not experience time at a different speed, per se, because he doesn't experience time at all. God has all of history rolled out in front of him. And he knows everything that will happen from beginning to end, all the way down to the atomic level. So, of course, our perspective of time would appear as nothing to him. It's all about perspective. I'm reminded of a time in second grade where the teacher led us in an exercise to learn just how long a minute really felt like. We sat down cross-legged in front of the class one day. I remember it clearly, and the teacher said, okay, now how many of you, show of hands, have been quiet and sat still for an entire minute before? And of course, nobody raised their hand because what second grader would, would ever sit still and quiet for that amount of time? So led by the teacher, to learn what a whole minute felt like, the whole class sat quiet and still for an entire minute, and without counting, the teacher kept track on her watch of one minute exactly as it went by. And I still remember how strange it felt. When you're at that age, sitting in silence, doing nothing for an entire minute, feels like an eternity. But now, as adults, we're lucky if an hour is enough time for us to accomplish some task that we wish to do, right? But why is that? It's all about our perspective. For a child, a minute or an hour, even a day, is a huge percentage of that child's life so far. Now, compared to that of an adult, by the time you're 20 or 30 or 40 and so on, that same denomination of time is now a much smaller percentage of our lived experience. Therefore, for those same moments of time that we reflect on, they feel quicker and quicker and quicker to us as time goes on because our perspective is longer. And with that comes the wisdom, hopefully, that difficult seasons are not as long as we think, and that it is all the more important for us to use our time wisely. Now, take that concept and stretch it all the way out to the infinite God. God's perspective is infinite, so our daily aches and complaints and worries are just specks to him. And as we remind ourselves week in, and week out, God isn't surprised by anything that happens. Because he sees it all before him. And I like how C.S. Lewis famously described, we as finite people relate to the infinite God as people living as if within the pages of a book in the process of being written. From our perspective, we know what our story is right now in the moment, but we cannot yet see what's going to be on the pages ahead. 
from our perspective, we cannot see that. And yet, God knows in the span of time exactly what he is going to write. With all these things in mind, then, let's turn our attention to verse 10. The span of our life is 70 years, perhaps in strength even 80. Yet the sum of them is but labor and sorrow, for they pass away quickly, and we are gone. Now, for some that may sound depressing, but there's tremendous wisdom to be found here. These words were conceived of thousands of years ago, yet has our span of life changed? No, it hasn't. But do we act as if we can live longer than that? Yes, yes we can. For all of our technological advancements and achievements in medicine, for all of our special diets and superstitions, man still lives to be about 70 to 80 years on average. Certainly, technological advancement and medical advancement have increased the percentage of us who can live longer and it has improved our quality of life. For that, we give thanks and praise to God. But what we see now, more than ever, is a willful ignorance that humans will somehow live forever here on this earth. Verse 12 is really the conclusion of the 11 verses before it. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. The right numbering of our days, that is, having the right perspective on our lives as we relate to the eternal God, is a necessary precondition to apply our hearts to wisdom. You don't have one without the other. Take again verse 10 as an example. We live in a culture that thinks we have the ability to live on the earth forever and ever if we just do the right things. As a whole, we don't actually number our days. In fact, we don't number them at all because we tend to think that our days here are infinite. So what happens as a result? The result is a perverse sort of wisdom, a worldly wisdom which we see so passionately on display all around us each and every day. What we end up with is an inverse of priorities in which temporal, temporary things, fleeting feelings and appetites are prioritized over things of eternal importance, things like goodness and beauty and truth and virtue. We end up with an inverse of these priorities. And some examples, we, we end up, for example, with a worship of the environment, a call to recreate all of civilization and subject ourselves to needless poverty and mass starvation and a desperate and misguided attempt to control the climate. Climate alarmism is rooted in a false numbering of our days, and it is rooted in the idea that Earth must last forever because humanity must last forever on this Earth. Or worse, it gives birth to the idea that human beings are nothing but a parasite, a blight upon the world itself, a blight upon Mother Nature, as it were. And that human flourishing itself is, in fact, a problem. Christians must instead advocate for those things which increase human flourishing, while also caring for and stewarding the environment without buying in to all of the climate doom, because we know that one day Christ will come and heaven and earth will pass away and he will usher in a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth. And until then, we have been put in charge of taking care of God's creation. When we forget to number our days, we also end up with a cult of public health. When this life is all that you have, then protecting your life becomes 
the highest priority. And in the process of desperately, and I would add unsuccessfully, trying to preserve one's life, life itself has actually become devalued. It's become devalued. And because of that, humanity abhors a vacuum. And a godless people has taken up for itself a public health totalitarianism as its new religion. The public health experts for these people are the new priests. Public health measures are the sacraments. And we have, like pagans, moralized a virus that is beyond human control. And we act like only the holiest of people will not get sick. If you do all of the right things perfectly and follow the new law, the virus will not harm you. But anyone who falls ill somehow deserves it for their sins against public health. If you live in fear of death, you may preserve your life for a time. It may, it may work for a season, but you are not truly living. This is why we Christians must properly number our days and double down on our hope in Christ, that by faith in him our sins are forgiven, and in so doing we are assured of our eternal life with him and that it has already begun and it cannot be taken away from us. The author of Hebrews assures us of this. For we read in chapter 3 that Moses labored in God's house, but Jesus Christ has been set as Lord over God's house. And we, as the church, are that house. We are Christ's church. And we are his house, the author says, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. The body of Christ is eternal, but we will be blind to that if we do not properly number our days and focus only on temporary affairs. As Christ's church, we have an eternal comfort and an eternal perspective. And so we hold fast to him in confidence. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. We must read our Old Testament reading through the same lens. The prophet Amos, in fact, speaks to Israel in a very similar situation to the one in which we find ourselves today. As we learned earlier in this Pentecost season, at the time of the prophet Amos, Israel was experiencing a time of peace for Assyria, the dominant world power at the time, was undergoing some stresses of its own. It was experiencing pressure from many different sides and other countries and and nations, and Assyria didn't have the resources to dominate other civilizations as it had in years past. So the Israelites had taken advantage of this, and they had something of a, of a false golden age. And they took this time of material prosperity as a sign of their own righteousness. But what they were actually experiencing was a last gasp of a civilization on fumes that was soon to come off life support. The prophet warns the people, seek the Lord and live. The people of Israel are day after day looking to themselves for comfort. They're looking to their material wealth for their comfort as well. But Israel is close to destruction, and they just keep patting themselves on the back. Through the prophets, God is urging them to return to him. Later on, in the passage from chapter 5, we encounter another sign of the times. Therefore, he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, 
that you may live. What's going on here? At first glance, we may think God is telling his people not to speak the truth, but that isn't quite the case. What he's actually doing is encouraging the faithful to prudence and discretion. The prophet is calling out the perversion of justice at the city gates, where the old men of the city would listen to cases of wrongdoing that were brought before them and offer up judgment. And in this case, rather than ruling justly, these men were instead making judgments based on bribery. The prudence of the faithful comes in when we exercise discretion in how we engage with the world. If we run around like maniacs yelling at all of the people who are doing things wrong, well, we're going to tire ourselves out pretty quickly, and we're not going to make any friends for sure, but we're not going to convert any hearts and minds running around like crazy people. But also, if our focus is too narrow, then we will be focused on vengeance against wrongdoers. But if we truly see life from an eternal perspective, how then should we think of our enemies? If we affirm hell and heaven to be a reality, should we wish evil upon our political and moral opponents? Or should we pray for their conversion and their salvation? Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. If this life is all there is to be had, then we will be tempted to seek the vengeance of those who oppose us. But for the Christian, we should know that no less than eternal life is at stake. And if nothing else, we must pray as we do week in and week out, through our common prayer tradition, we should pray for those who persecute us and pray for our leaders and those in charge over us, whether or not we agree with what they're doing. Do we desire to see our politicians, for example, denied communion out of some sort of perverse pleasure or Do we desire and pray for them to be converted? It's a tough question for myself to answer as well. Do we wish for misfortune to fall upon those who hate us? Or do we pray for God to redeem them? If we so number our days, we will then learn to hate evil and to love good. Lastly, Let us turn to the passage from chapter 10 in Mark's gospel. And here we read the account of the rich man and Jesus. This is a longer passage and there's a lot going on here. So I want to focus primarily on the stark contrast between the rich young man's attitude and the truth which Jesus speaks. The rich young man is just as the Israelites were in the book of Amos and just as our contemporaries are today. He was proud of his material wealth. He saw it as a sign of his righteousness, and he looked to it for validation. As a result, the rich young men, the rich young man elevated worldly goods above the obedient faith required to follow Jesus. And you can see it even in how he answers the question, or how he asks the question. You can tell he thinks he already knows the answer. He's coming up to Jesus just for further validation. He's not so much interested in hearing the real answer. According to the young man, he's already kept all of the commandments since his youth. And as with the rich man, if we are preoccupied with our immediate concerns... If it's always me, 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 then we too will look to God just to affirm what we're already doing. How often do we do that already? We come to church, we pay God lip service, we do what makes us feel good, we cherry pick the verses 
that each week tell us we're doing a good job. There's no need to change. No course correction needed here. And then what happens? Well, Jesus asks the rich man to sell all his possessions, to give to the poor, and to follow him. The point here is not that we as Christians necessarily need to sell all of our possessions and give to the poor, but that's not necessary in a literal sense in order to be saved, but that Jesus is calling out the young man on his warped perspective. All of our worldly goods and even our own well-being must come second to a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Toward the end of the passage, we even see the disciples have trouble with this. Jesus warns them, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples respond, exceedingly astonished, then who can be saved? The disciples too, as part of their own culture, would have first understood wealth to be a sign of righteousness. What the heck are you talking about here, Jesus? And then, of course, Peter, not to be outdone, always the first one to speak up, says, Hey, look, Jesus, we left everything and followed you. And Peter was not necessarily out of line in saying this because as a fisherman, as probably a successful fisherman, he would have left behind significant possessions and taken on real risk in following Jesus. Are we willing to risk the same, brothers and sisters? And Jesus, he answers Peter, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Brothers and sisters, we cannot save ourselves. When we focus on this life, when we focus on our stuff, when we focus on just not getting sick or getting rich or being well-liked, what we are saying is that we, in fact, can save ourselves. But salvation is found only through the blood of Jesus Christ, who died for us and has freed us from all sin if we trust in him. And as Jesus tells his disciples, the beauty is that if we number our days and apply our hearts to wisdom and follow the Lord, we are guaranteed an eternal blessing, which is far greater than anything else this world can provide. Yes, God is merciful to bless us, in this life, but as Jesus warns the disciples, the blessings this side of heaven will come with persecutions. And as we march forward into a post-Christian world, we know that persecutions will come. But let us number our days and apply our hearts to wisdom. And may the glory of God eternal put all else into perspective and free us truly to live. Let us close by reflecting once more on the words of today's gradual hymn. O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Under the shadow of thy throne, thy saints have dwelt secure. Sufficient is thine arm alone, and our defense is sure. Before the hills in order stood, or earth received her frame, from everlasting thou art God, to endless years the same. A thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone, short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun. Time, like an ever rolling stream, bears all its suns away. They fly forgotten as a dream, dies at the opening day. O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, be thou our God while troubles last, and our eternal home. In the name of the Father, 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.